بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد uh, continuing the beautiful story of Ibrahim عليه السلام سورة العام we are on verse 76 uh, so just to refresh our minds this is the con is in a particular context and that is Ibrahim عليه السلام debating his people the the series of verses begins with the statement of Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, to his father that, you know, are you really worshipping these idols which are just stones and they cannot function in any way, they cannot hear you, they cannot see you, and you're worshipping multiple gods. And so he poses an argument but in a question format. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he rewarded Ibrahim alayhi salam by showing him the wonders of the universe from a theological perspective meaning because Ibrahim took the time to consider theology and he stood up for what he knew to be the truth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded him with this reward now I, we were just talking about this when we do a good deed and we are hopeful for reward what tends to come to our mind well I hope Allah increases the amount of money I'm making and again there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing inherently uh, problematic with that. But we are pursuing that which is very, very low in the broader scheme of things. And what uh, having more money, a larger number in your bank account, might bring you an amount of happiness or amount of joy. But turning the entire world around you into something that charges your mind, charges your heart with spirituality, with insight, with information, with knowledge, is much more much more valuable than having a larger number in your bank account that you every now and then you open your bank application and you see it right also when the world is providing you with this information it's providing you with a lot a lot higher quality than what you can buy with your money and what in the end what are you going to buy how many shoes do you really need and all the different types of shoes i mean in the end what is it going to differ and this is not an issue of halal and haram. It's not an issue of if you have a lot of shoes, that means you're a bad Muslim. Or you are a worldly oriented Muslim who could care less about the afterlife. But rather the point is, you know, how do we see these things? If you have the money to buy multiple pairs of shoes, you know, by all means, go for it. That's not what I'm trying to challenge here. It's not what I'm trying to change. But rather to change the perception of, you know, what is this really providing me? All these shoes, just look at your shoes and say, what are, what are these really providing me other than a utility? A, com a little bit of comfort that will last with me for a year or so until I need a new pair of shoes. And so, you know, you can never really build a meaningful relationship with your shoes. It's just, it's not going to stick around a long time. <laughs> but you can build a meaningful relationship with the sun and the moon. It'll always be there. And it'll always be with your kids as well, and their kids, and their kids. You can build a meaningful relationship with the sky, with the clouds, with the earth. I don't mean that in kind of the, the eco-hippie friendly uh, meaning. I mean that in terms of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So subhanAllah, the things that are most meaningful in life, or at least can provide the most to us, are things that are permanent, relatively speaking, permanent to our lives. The sun and the moon are permanent in our lives. I mean, we don't expect a day where the sun doesn't come out. And when the sun doesn't come out, or at least it, it rises from the west, and then it, that, that the, the world is done. You know, the, the day of judgment is about to start. So Allah, this is in His blessings that He used the natural world, which has a type of permanence, uh, have, has a type of constant, for us to build a relationship with Him, not the material which comes and goes. I mean, the value of the dollar is constantly decreasing, and decreasing, and decreasing. So someone who, whose relationship and attachments are exclusive or predominantly attached to the material, they're attaching themselves to something that constantly decreases, becoming less meaningful that is close to departing you. And that's not what we want. So Allah rewarded Ibrahim with a truly fascinating uh, and mesmerizing reward, and that is to have insight 
the natural world uh, around him. And then continuing, this is where we get to verse 76. فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْلُ رَأَى كَوْكَبًا um, So when night has set in. Now the word jen uh, means to set in uh, after something prior to it was there. So, uh, so daytime was there and then night set in. So it overpowered the day and set in. So when he was taken, when night had took over, he saw kawkaba. He saw a celestial body. Now a kawkab is, as I translated, a celestial body, which includes stars and includes planets. So anything in the sky is a celestial body. Now, what is going on here? We need a little bit of context. There are two, two primary forms of shirk. The, the first and most common is the worshipping of revered figures, revered people, whether they were real or not. So when you look at Quraysh, who did they used to worship? Lat, Uzza, Manat. Who are these three people? They were individuals who were once alive, who were once among the Arabs, who did things that, was, that were very praiseworthy to the Arabs. Like they were very generous, they were very hospitable. Uh, they they uh, very hospitable to the pilgrims when they would come in, and so they were very respected and revered among the community. When they passed away, they continued to express that reverence by making these idols in respect to them as a uh, memorial for them, and then they were slowly worshipped. Besides Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. When a lot, some of the Muslims and some people in the Muslim world who worship the Prophet ﷺ, I mean, what is the idea there? So we love him so much that, I mean, he has to be above a human being. Same thing with Isa ﷺ. From how much they love Isa ﷺ, they worshipped him. As Allah says, يحبونهم كحب الله. They love these things the way they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's inappropriate, that's shirk. They, they, uh, we, it is obligatory upon us to love the prophets but that love is limited it's regulated we love them to an extent we will never worship them ever right. uh, as Allah says never has a prophet never has a person a human being been given prophethood and a sunnah and divine revelation wahi and then he would go and tell people to worship him besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love of the human being is limited. Whereas love of Allah is infinite. How much we love Allah needs to be infinite. Without limits. And the, the, the grandest way of expressing our love is through worship. And I, I always give the example of would you ever prostrate to your parents? Would, I, would you ever prostrate to your children? You know, the most beloved people to you? No. I would never do that. I love you so much, but there's a limit. The same thing applies to even the prophets and the righteous people. So that's the first form. The second form, right? And the second form of shirk is worshipping the celestial bodies. And this is what the people of Ibrahim السلام, were doing. They were worshipping the celestial bodies. But what is the idea there? So the idea of the first type of shirk is love. These people are revered figures who we love very much and out of our love, they start worshipping them. Okay? And Allah tells us that's not allowed. What is the idea, the background of worshipping the celestial bodies? It's actually a more scientific uh, explanation. Where through observation, they found certain repetitions in the way the ecosystem is working. Sometimes, or what they notice, for example, whenever a particular star... Um, is on the horizon or appears, they notice and they observe that within the next day or two, it rains. Within the next day or two, it rains. They notice that when this celestial body sets, something happens. They notice that um, when there's a full moon, that is when earthquakes happen. Or no, not that. When um, an eclipse occurs, within the next few days, an earthquake happens. So they notice these 
kind of connections, these patterns. And so from a purely scientific perspective, we know that what happens in the ecosystems is connected, it's interconnected. And that's how we are able to predict the weather. How hot is it going, how warm is it going to be tomorrow? I mean, they can get it almost on the dots. Based on what? Based on these patterns. How do we know when it's going to rain or the prediction for rain and the percentage, the percentage likelihood of, of, of it raining because of these patterns? Okay. So Islam doesn't disagree with that. But what these people do is what? Think that these celestial bodies have a will independent of Allah. And therefore it rained because the star caused it to rain. An earthquake occurred because the eclipse caused it to happen. Rather, we say there are patterns when an eclipse happens, for example, if this is factually correct, when an eclipse happens, an earthquake happened during the eclipse, not because of the eclipse. Rather, Allah, the one who caused the eclipse, is the one who caused the, the, uh, the earthquake. And so notice that when the Dajjal comes out, what happens? One of the most common commonly known information about the, uh, the Dajjal is that when he's out, something happens to the sun where one 24-hour cycle becomes 365 days. So the sun will go one circle, or the earth will orbit or on its own axis, right, once, but in 360 days. So there'll only be one sunrise and one sunset in 365 days. Companions asked, Ya Rasulullah, would five salahs be enough for that time? Mm. Prophet said, no. Qadiru lahu taqdira. Estimate. Estimate how much the time is. No, you have to pay five, five uh, prayers every 24 hours. And then just estimate the time difference between them. So we know that happens. Now, what is, how do we as Muslims interpret this? Well, very often we find that events in the sky correlates to events on earth. So when the Prophet ﷺ was sent and Quran began to come down, the jinn started to notice that the sky is going crazy. There are meteors and shooting stars left and right, a lot more than what we're accustomed to. So Information goes back to Iblis. The shayateen start telling Iblis, Iblis, there's something going on in the sky. There's a lot. So Iblis said that, that what's going on in the sky is telling us something's going on on earth. Go look. Go look around. Go find out what happened. And they're, 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 his, his soldiers are going around looking for what, what happened. And then one comes back and said, there is someone in Mecca saying, La ilaha illallah. He said, that's it. And Allah documents this in Surah Al-Jinn, the 72nd chapter. Right? So that event in the heavens was correlating with the event on earth. Same thing with the Jad comes out. A major event on earth that it has, has huge implications on humanity. I mean, when you look at what, um, how he's described, you know, he'll be walking around with a paradise on his right and a fire on his left. He will cause, he will split someone in half and then put them back together and these things. You know, in our mindset today, the scientific mindset, everything is explained by science. It, the Jad comes and he completely destroys this. Do you, do you see the implications? It's huge. It's absolutely huge. He's doing things that cannot be explained by science. Cannot. Right? And Allah either has given him the power to do that or what the Dajjal is doing is actually all uh, illusion, but of an of a incredible sort. Okay. So a major event on earth is now being correlated with what? A major event in the sky. But we as believers say the one who is causing that to happen in the sky is the one who sent the Dajjal. I'm, I shouldn't say it that way. Is the one who allowed the Dajjal to do what he's doing. For us, the appearance of the sky and the coming of, or the appearance of the star and the coming of rain is a sign that the one who made the star appears, the one who made the rain come. They both go back to Allah. The shirk happens when? When they say, it is the star that independent of Allah's will caused this to happen. That is where the shirk comes from. And that was the shirk of 
uh, the people of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So the, when night sat in, he saw a celestial body and Ibrahim said, that is my Lord. Okay, Ibrahim, you were just talking about you know, Tawheed. Now you're saying, this is my Lord? The most common opinion is that Ibrahim alayhi salam was playing a game, not a game, he was establishing his argument against his people. So he was saying, this is my Lord, not in the sense that this is what I truly believe, or I am trying to understand, is this my Lord or not? But rather, he was building an argument against his people. By making the same claim they're saying, and then countering it. Because, you know, when we, when we, um, this is actually a very effective way of making arguments. By reminding the person what they actually believe in, and then showing how silly it is. I don't know if you saw, there's a video, I don't know if it's recently posted on YouTube, but a video of a small, beautiful young girl, probably just a few years old. And her father was teaching her about the Bible, and she had a, a Bible book for children or whatever. And she, the, the girl is reading, and she, I guess she, there's a verse in the Bible that says, and Jesus uh, uh, increased his knowledge of God, of his father. right? And this young girl says, Daddy, if Jesus is God, how did he increase his knowledge of himself? If Jesus is God, how did he not know about himself? Do you see what she's... What's being said here? Right? He couldn't give her an answer. He said, well, you know, when he became a human, he this is it's a very unconvincing answer. He was shocked. Now, there's a, there's a saying that sometimes the angels speak on the tongues of children. Right? You know, now people are praising, this is a young girl, mashallah, she's so smart, etc. It's an angel who said that on her tongue. To tell her father, what are you, what are you saying? You know, you, you're contradicting your own self. How did, if Jesus is God, how did he learn about himself? And if that really is God, that's not a God worthy of worship. Because his knowledge is an infinite. Right? Um, so this is the thing Ibrahim is saying. Now there are a few different opinions among the scholars. One is that, قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي is a, he's a, It's actually a question. So this is my Lord. It's like a rhetorical question. This is my Lord. So he's not saying, this is my Lord, as he's making a statement. Rather, he's posing a rhetorical question. This is my Lord. Oh, oh my people, you're telling me, this is my Lord? Right? So that's another way of understanding it. فَلَمَّا أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْآفِلِينَ أَفَلَ, this verb means, for, it to dis, for something to disappear and leave behind no trace. Leave behind no trace. Right? So... When the star set, um, he said, I don't love that which disappears. Okay. Ibrahim is making an argument here. He's saying because it disappeared, it's not worthy of worship. This star is not worthy of worship because it disappeared. Now, the question is the following. Has anyone seen Allah? But before we get to that, you know, he's saying that this star isn't worthy of being my Lord because it disappeared. Yet we've never seen Allah in the first place. So what is the argument he's making? Do you understand the question? Yeah. Saying, okay. Ibrahim is, is making the argument that because the star disappears, it's not worthy of worship. Now, Allah has not been seen by us. So the star was seen and then disappeared. Allah has never been seen. So how is Ibrahim using the disappearing of the star as an argument that the star isn't worthy of worship when we've never seen Allah in the first place? Does that make sense? So, um, I need a confident yes. Yes. If you really understand it. Because it's Allah who naps the no, but we'll get to that. But do you understand the, 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 the question here? And how do we answer this? The word afala, the, the beauty of the Quran, the every word. The, I don't, as far as I remember, there's not a single other place in the Quran where this verb is used. Afala means to disappear and leave behind no trace. 
Ibrahim isn't making the argument that because the star disappeared, it's not worthy of worship. What he's making the argument is that it leaves no trace behind for us to know it's still there. It leaves no trace behind that we can use to actualize that the star is still there. Whereas Allah, we've never seen him. No one has ever seen him. Not even the Prophet But Allah has left behind an infinite amount of traces that points to him. When the sun sets, right? let's say someone is born, it's all of a sudden appears, full ability to comprehend knowledge, and etc. He appears all of a sudden in the, in the night. Is there anything that they can use to prove that there's a sun? No, there's nothing. It, that he needs the sun to actually rise, say, oh, wait, there's a sun. But when the sun sets, what happens to the temperature? What happens to the heat of the sun? What happens to the light of the sun? All of it disappears. As if it's never been there. As if it no longer exists. Same thing with the moon. When the moon sets, what happens to the waters? Nothing, it's, just, it's normal water. But when the moon rises, depending on the phase, what happens to the... It enforces certain things or causes certain things. But as soon as it sets, all of that is gone. It leaves behind no traces. And such a thing is not worthy of worship. Why? Because it's not constant. It's not always there. So the argument he's making isn't the disappearance of the thing, but la rather the lack of trace and effect after it sets. His effects are always there. His traces, so to speak, are always there. There are things that we can use to prove that he's there. Any time, any place. So if the sun sets, all the heat, the heat starts to go away. The light goes away. There's no way of proving its existence. Of course, now someone's going to be all fancy and say that, well, we have you know, technology and telescopes and satellites. It's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about the remnants of the sun. The heat goes away, the light goes away, we're left with nothing from the sun. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is in every single millisecond in complete control of what's going on. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Ibrahim says, I don't love that which disappears. So it wasn't a question. So he's making the argument, right? He said, This is my Lord. Wait a minute, where did it go? Hmm, let me go to the next one. All this is making an argument against, right? Um, I don't love that which disappears. So he's using now the word love. And it's important to understand this. We've spoken a lot about love. I don't love that which disappears. So it's telling us really two things. Number one, our relationship to Allah is based on love. And number two, and love needs to be something that's constant. It's not like, okay, today I love my children, tomorrow I don't love my children. All right? Today I love my, it's not the way, it's not love. You're not loving the person if today you love them, tomorrow you don't, and then after that you love them. Love is something that is rooted and therefore it's constant. It can increase and decrease, but it's not like black and white where today I love and tomorrow I don't. Where today I'm merciful, tomorrow I'm not. It's not that's not a merciful person. Okay. Uh, so you need that consistency. And in order to have such a relationship, you need that constant where Allah is constantly fueling my love for him by leaving behind the traces, by leaving me the trace, by leaving me access to him at any time, any place, any situation. And the star can simply cannot do that because I can love the stars if I see them, but as soon as I, they set, I can no longer do that. I can no longer express that love, etc. I have to wait until the next night. And we're not fortunate here to have access to many stars. We need to go out to Joshua Tree in order to see the beauty of the stars. Um, so you see the point here? How can I love such a body when it cannot provide me the means to constantly loving it? That's not worthy of worship. And worship is established on love. And when Ibrahim saw the, the moon clearly and apparently in front of him. Okay. He said, this is my Lord. So you went from something small to bigger. 
فلما أفل قال لئن لم يهدني ربي لأكونن من القوم الضالين So when the moon set, leaving behind no traces, he said, if my Lord doesn't guide me, then indeed I'm going to be among the misguided people. Again, all of this, he's being rhetorical with his people. He's establishing the argument against his people. His people are worshipping the celestial bodies. What are the celestial bodies? The stars and the planets. So the small things that you see. The moon and the sun. These three things. As far as I know, there are no other celestial bodies. The she had the shooting stars would just fall under the Kowakin category. When he saw the, the sun clear and apparent in front of him, he said, this is my Lord, this is the biggest of them all. Okay. When it set, left behind no traces, same argument. He said, oh my people, I am innocent of what you worship besides Allah. What you associate partners with besides Allah. So he went through all three possibilities when it comes to worshipping the celestial bodies. The stars, planets, and, and bodies that are small and distant. The moon and the sun. All of them have the same problem. They disappear, leaving behind no trace. And how can I establish a relationship with these things if for even a period of time I cannot connect with them. That is not a loving relationship. Okay. So he said, Oh my people, I am innocent and I am free of what you worship, associate besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your worship. Uh, I have positioned my face and in the Arabic language uh, it is common to uh, refer to an entire body by one of its essential parts. So, when it comes to the human being, the face, the head is like the essential part. It's the thing that we look at the most. It's the thing, the part of our body that we engage the most. So, it's the essential part. And so, I have positioned my face, meaning I have positioned my entire self. My entire self. Um, uh, to the one or towards the one who فطر السماوات والأرض we went over the word فطر which means to create right from nothing but uh, فطر uh, implies the knowledge behind it more so than the power right? more so than the power why? because فطر means to separate two things and to make them into independent entities right? so that is more about the knowledge element and then along with the power. Whereas khalaqa is the opposite. Khalaqa is to bring something out of nothing. That requires more power and then the knowledge. And we went over this in the first uh, uh, episode or the first session of this surah. So I've, I have positioned myself to the one who uh, created the heavens and the earth in the way he did subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hanifa. Um, Hanifa is as a monotheist. So the word Hanafa means to lean towards something. And so a Hanif is someone who is leaning towards Tawheed, towards the worship of Allah alone. Uh, he, her entire self, is leaning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, away from anything and everything besides him. So it's a very, very beautiful word. Now, why is Ibrahim alayhi salam saying the one who did فَطَرَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ instead of saying the one who created? The heavens and the earth, instead of saying the one خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And I think that's just contextual. That in the context and in the way his people are engaging the natural world, they are engaging the natural world in a way that limits the knowledge, that it's very limiting to the knowledge of these things. So maybe the stars and the moon from a purely scientific perspective affect what happens on earth. Of course, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they have an amount of power. But the way they do this is unintelligible. Meaning, these are inanimate objects. They don't have rationale. They, they're not, you know, if, if it's the star that causes the rain, according to the people, right? You know that the star is irrational. You know that these are entities that really have, are very limited in their functionalities. So... How is the star going to determine when I need rain? 
and how much rain I need, and where exactly rain is needed. So such an entity is not worthy of being worshipped. And such an entity causes problems. And if there is a problem, cannot solve it. Whereas the one who did Fatara samawati wal ard is the one who organized it in a way that is rational, in a way that brings the good to us and protects us from the harm. So it seems like they they were worshipping something. Ibrahim's argument is that you are worshipping something that is unintelligible. It doesn't have rationale. That's not something worthy of worship. Rather me, I worship the one who created all of this in a way that goes back to clear rationale, clear logic. It makes sense. And he's able to utilize all of these things in a way that brings about the good, brings results, brings fruits, and is not just random. وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ I am not, and I am not of those who uh, worship other than him. قَوْمُ His people debated him. They tried to establish an argument against him. قَالَ أَتُحَاجُّونِّي فِي اللَّهِ وَقَدْ هَدَانِ He responded, are you seriously arguing against me? Are you seriously arguing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And he has guided me. In other words, it's too obvious to try and deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's supremacy. It's too, it makes too much sense. It's too obvious. It's too consistent for us to start debating. Is this the reality or not? And other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is clearly inconsistent. It is clearly limited and thus not worthy of worship. It's not worthy of worship. And, you know, what's happening in pop culture today is that these Marvel movies, you know, Marvel movies, like Superman, not Superman, I'm sorry, like Spider-Man and uh, Iron Man and Captain America and these the Avengers and whatnot. Uh, it's becoming clearer and clearer they are trying to promote a type of theology. So they're incorporating these theological elements in their movies. Uh, and, you know, I, I enjoy these movies. I grew up watching the comics and these cartoons and whatnot. So I enjoy the movies and it's a fun exercise for me personally to kind of try and find how they are putting theology, their own perceptions of reality in, these, um, in this pop culture way. And then asking myself, okay, what is my Islamic argument against it? And it always goes back to really the, these two main things. Either what they are saying shows a person or a, a divine being or whatever, a superpower, but they either lack strength or infinite strength or they lack infinite knowledge. It goes back to these two things. Just like Surah Fatir or Surah uh, that Naam began with, if you remember. It always goes back. It's such a beautiful thing to appreciate about the Qur'an. It simplifies everything. It simplifies all the problems. It simplifies all the issues. And you can trace it back to a common problem, a common root. And then from there you branch out. So Ibrahim uh, is saying, are, are you seriously arguing, arguing against me? Trying to disprove what my stance. And my stance is what? Allah is the only one worthy of worship because He is the only one who is complete. He's the only one who is perfect. Right? And hadan, and He has guided me. Meaning, look at the argument I just made against you. And in Surah al uh, Surah al Anbiya, uh, there's a clear, there's a little bit more clarity when it comes to this story. When Ibrahim made the argument, are you worshiping these idols besides God? And they cannot speak, they cannot do anything to defend themselves. What did Allah, how did Allah describe their reaction? They went like this. You know what? He's right. And they're like, eh, our, we don't care. We have judged against you or adjudicated against you that you are to be thrown in the fire. So they know what Ibrahim is saying is correct. And Ibrahim is saying, you know that I'm guided in what I'm saying. What I'm saying is correct. And like this example of this young girl who told her father, I mean, it was shocking to him. It was a shocking argument. He did not know what to say and then he tried to scramble himself and give an answer. Right? And so, you know, why didn't he just say, you know what, that's a good point, I need to think about that. You know what, I might be wrong about my theology. We as Muslims, you know, we might say it's, it's oh, why aren't they questioning themselves more? Why aren't they coming to the truth more and whatnot? Um, you know, we shouldn't 
take it for granted that we might not be the same way. But when you look at how we teach ourselves Islam, what the scholars teach us, it really heavily revolves around questioning the self. Not questioning our beliefs per se, but questioning our sincerity, for example. Is what I am doing truly pleasing Allah or not? Is what I am doing truly what Allah wants of me? What Allah wants me to do? Now it develops this mentality where as soon as we understand that we did something wrong, we see that we did something wrong, we are, we are already prone to correcting ourselves. But it comes from something prior, a framework, a mentality of the self, where I am wrong until I prove myself otherwise. I am insincere until I work towards sincerity. I am imperfect, I am incomplete in my iman, and I need to work towards it. Right? That is the framework that a Muslim needs to have, a mindset that a Muslim needs to have. But if I'm going in saying, I am the truth, and I know the truth, and all that I do is the truth, then that person is really going to be taken by their ego, and taken by their, their own arrogance. We ask Allah to protect us. Why don't we go ahead and stop here? And we'll continue the verse uh, next time, inshallah. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.